What up, Kim folks? This is your boy Screwface Capone, and today we are going to unbox the Sega Genesis Mini. I know I promised this for weeks, but finally we're going to do it. Anyway, um, I know you see, um, I know you've been in Walmart and you've been in Target or other stores, and you've seen those other Genesis consoles, the ones with the um, 40 or 80 games preloaded onto it, and they let you play the original cartridges with the controllers. Um, this is different from that. What those consoles were, they were from a company called At Games. What it was, was like, um, after the Sega Genesis was discontinued, um, they licensed out the hardware to different manufacturers, so they were coming out with their own versions of the Sega Genesis. And uh, you've also seen that um, Retron 5, where that lets you play both the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis cartridges on one unit. But um, the At Games versions, at least the first the first iterations of it, they were um, they were criticized for like having a lot of filler games and having poor emulation quality. But um, for what I hear, the most recent version they came out with, um, which coincidentally also looks like the original Sega Genesis, but like um, a bit bigger. Um, apparently, um, that's not too bad compared to the prior versions. But still, um, the thing with this one now it doesn't let you now obviously this one doesn't let you play any cartridges, but um, you got um, it's actually made and endorsed directly by Sega. So, um, as you can see, the packaging looks authentic. Um, it almost looks like like what what you would get like if you were buying a console back in like 1991 or whatever. You know, speaking of which, um, growing up, you know, I was either a, um, I was a, I was a big Super Nintendo guy. That was my system. I eventually got a Sega Genesis, and like. The thing was, and this is why console exclusives are so important, by the way. Like, a lot of the third-party games that were on both Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, they looked better on Super Nintendo most of the time. But, on both systems, they had their share of exclusives that you'd want that, um, you'd see yourself buying the system just to play. So, like, on the Super Nintendo, you had your Mario, you had your Zelda, you had your Super Castlevania 4. Well, on the Genesis, you had your Sonic, you had your Streets of Rage, you had your Fantasy Star, and you had um, Castlevania Bloodlines. So, um, this was the system that was that was um, that was in control of most of the 16-bit era, at least in North America. So, before we unbox it, what I like to do is go through a brief history of the Sega Genesis as well as the beginnings of Sega. So, strap in, buckle up. We're gonna get into some gaming archaeology. To examine the history of the Sega Genesis, one must first go back and examine the history of the company known as Sega as well as the climate of the gaming industry at the time of its emergence. The story of the Genesis first starts several years before with the rise of Sega's biggest competitor, Nintendo. When you get hold of the Nintendo Entertainment System. When Nintendo revived the North American gaming market with the US release of the Famicom, or the Nintendo Entertainment System as we knew it, the company changed video gaming forever. However, in doing so, it implemented a series of heavy-handed licensing policies. Among these policies, the company limited the amount of games the company could produce a year. They also locked companies into time exclusivity deals for games that were released on the NES console. These policies were designed to prevent the oversaturation of the market that resulted in the gaming crash years prior. However, they would also starve the competition out of much needed third party support. One of these competitors was Sega, who at the time had just released the 8 bit Sega Master System. The Sega Master System. With more accurate control, more detailed graphics, more levels of play. Awesome. The Sega Master System comes with Power Base 2 control pads, Light Phaser, and two great video games. Hang on, it's a Safari Hunt. Gotcha. And with other games like Ramble, Outrun, and Choplifter, the excitement never stops. The Sega Master System. The challenge will always be there. Sega would begin life as Standard Games, a Hawaii-based company that primarily specialized in coin-op game machines for overseas military bases. Over a decade later, the company would move to Japan, renaming itself Service Games and eventually Sega Enterprises. 
During the 60s, Sega would enter the arcade market with a shooting gallery game known as Periscope. Throughout the next two decades, Sega would find further success in the arcades, including games like Zaxxon, Space Harrier, and Outrun. In 1981, Sega would enter the gaming market with the SG-1000, a gaming console released in Japan, along with Australia and New Zealand among other regions. It was a commercial failure, due in part to the system releasing in Japan on the same day as Nintendo's Famicom. However, Sega would continue in the console market with the Sega Master System. Sega would see a bit more success with this system, along with a US release. However, the lack of third-party support would mean that Sega would have to develop its own software in-house. The only other companies producing games on the system were Activision and Parker Brothers. By the end of the system's run, the newly released Nintendo Entertainment System would command 83% of the market share. If Sega was to remain in the console business, it was clear that they had to swing for the fences. In 1989, they would set out to do just that when the Mega Drive arrived in the U.S. as the Sega Genesis. 16-bit arcade graphics. The Sega Genesis made use of a Motorola 68000 microprocessor as the main CPU, with a Z-Log Z80 as an additional microprocessor to handle the sound. The goal was to adapt the Sega System 16 arcade board into the home console. Many of Sega's arcade titles around this period, such as Golden Axe, E-SWAT, and Shinobi, made use of some version of this hardware, so this made it easy to port them to the system. This made the Sega Genesis attractive to buyers who were looking to bring the arcade experience home. In addition to the System 16 games, Sega would also develop home ports of Capcom arcade games such as Strider and Ghouls and Ghosts. Sega would also obtain the endorsements of several athletes and celebrities and produce a series of sports games featuring their names and likenesses. Thus, the system's early lineup included sports titles such as James Douglas Boxing, Joe Montana Football, and Tommy Lasorda Baseball. Since Sega still lacked strong third-party support, this move was intended to give the Genesis an identity of its own. Not only would the Genesis give you your favorite arcade titles, but it would also give you top quality sports games as well. Thanks to the power base converter, the Genesis was backwardly compatible with Sega Master System games, giving it an instantly sizable library at launch. Still, the system was only able to move 500,000 units in its first year. Michael Katz was the CEO of Sega of America at the time and spearheaded the new system's marketing. His efforts included the You Can't Do This on Nintendo jingle. However, his failure to move a million units in the first year would see him being replaced by Tom Kalinske. Although the former Mattel executive didn't know much about video games, he would surround himself with people who did. His approach to marketing his Sega Genesis was simple. Double down on shots at Nintendo, reduce the price, and produce a bundle that included Sonic the Hedgehog, a mascot platformer, as the pack in game. Sonic the Hedgehog was an original console exclusive that could not only showcase what the system could do, but it finally gave the Sega Genesis a killer app that could appeal to gamers of all audiences. By the time Nintendo was able to answer back with the 1991 release of the Super NES, the Genesis had already had a sizable install base in a library of dozens of titles, including Sonic. Sonic was one of many original franchises that had its start on the Genesis. Throughout the system's lifespan, fans would be treated to a deluge of original titles and franchises such as Echo the Dolphin, Streets of Rage, Vector Man, and Gunstar Heroes. Things would get even better for Sega in the early 90s with the release of Mortal Kombat. When the game was released on Nintendo systems in 1992, Nintendo forced the developers to remove the blood and fatalities, which was the main feature that set it apart from other fighting games. Sega would leave the blood and gore intact, although it was hidden behind a code. This move would continue to haunt Nintendo to this day, as they would have a reputation for producing product aimed at children and be the driving force behind the increased sales of the Sega Genesis during the mid-90s. Even better, as a result of an antitrust lawsuit, Nintendo was forced to end some of its more restrictive policies, and publishers who previously only produced content for Nintendo would bring their franchise over to Sega, among them being Konami's Castlevania and Contra, along with Capcom's Mega Man and Street Fighter. Sega would also produce two expansions for the Genesis, the Sega CD and a 32X. 
The former was an attempt to capitalize on the ever-growing CD-based gaming market, while the latter was meant to be a stopgap between the Sega Genesis and the upcoming Sega Saturn. Both add-ons were a failure due to the lack of quality software and dwindling support for both platforms, while the Sega CD's full-motion video games, including the controversial Night Trap, were eye-catching, they lacked much in the way of replay value. As for the 32X, many of the system's games barely looked better than the Genesis, despite the system having been advertised as being able to display over 32,000 colors. Also, it didn't make much sense to have a 32-bit add-on when you had an actual 32-bit console in development, especially as you expect developers and consumers to support both. Ultimately, the decline of the Genesis was due to both the impending rise of the 32-bit era and Nintendo's increasing user base. The period between 1994 and 1996 would see some of the most successful titles released for the Super Nintendo. Donkey Kong Country in particular helped the console overtake the Genesis in holiday season sales for the first time since both systems were released. Also, with the release of the Saturn, Sega would pull the plug on Sega Genesis support in both Japan and the US. Although this made a bit of sense in Japan, where it was still a distant third behind NEC's PC engine, it hurt the system in the US as there were still consumers still actively supporting the system. Furthermore, with the Saturn having a price point of $400 and lacking quality software due to its rushed launch, many consumers were reluctant to move on to the Saturn especially given the failure of the 32X. Still, with it, the Sony PlayStation and Nintendo's N64 gaining an increasing market share, the 16-bit era was coming to an end. During the last few years of the Sega Genesis existence, there wasn't much in the way of new releases, just prerequisite sports titles and third-party ports, Sonic 3D Blast, and the Genesis version of Virtual Fighter 2. The final Sega Genesis game released in North America was a version of Frogger, which was released in 1998. However, that wouldn't be the end of the system. After it was discontinued, Sega would license out the hardware to third-party manufacturers who would produce their own versions of the console, the first of which would be Majesco's Genesis 3. Most recently, At Games has released several iterations of their Genesis Flashback console. These consoles have several classic Genesis games preloaded onto the system along with being compatible with the original cartridges and the original controllers. However, they have faced criticism for their poor quality of emulation, along with the amount of filler games on the system. Analog, a company that specializes in hardware for retro games, has released its Mega SG, which allows users to play the original cartridges with upscaled graphics, HDMI compatibility, and high fidelity sound. Amazingly, there are also developers still developing and publishing games for the Sega Genesis as well. Most notably, Super Fighter Team, a California-based publisher, is specialized in bringing over classic games that have been previously unavailable in North America. Among the releases are the games Legend of Wu Kong, Vixen 357, and Baker Prince. Last but not least, Sega themselves will capitalize on their 16-bit legacy. After exiting the market as a console manufacturer, Sega will make many of its classic titles available either by the various compilations that have been released or by single games being released via online networks for gaming consoles, mobile devices, and PCs. The latter of which being done by way of Valve's Steam distribution platform. The Steam releases even feature a 3D interface and workshop support for ROM hacks. And of course, Sega has decided to enter the plug and play market on its own with the Sega Genesis Mini. And with that, let's get back to our unboxing. Now we are back. So we're finally going to unbox this bad boy. Alright, so let's take a look at the back. So here's all the games that you're going to get with it. Um, as you can see, you've got your usual suspects like um, Sonic the Hedgehog, um, Sonic 2. You've got, um, let's see, what else you got? You've got Virtue Fighter. Why the hell is that on here still? I mean... <laughs> It sucks, but hey. Um, there's Golden Axe. And the interesting thing about this, like, um, if you if um, you ever played, if you ever seen any the compilation that they released that I mentioned in the um, that I mentioned during the documentary, um, it's mostly um, 
just Sega first party titles, but um, there's actually several licensed titles as well as um, there's actually several third party licensed titles on here. So, um, so you got Castle of Illusion featuring Mickey Mouse, there's Contra Hardcore, um, you got Castlevania Bloodlines, um, you even got um, you even got Street Fighter, you've got um, let's see, there's version of Street Fighter, yeah. There's also Strider, which I mentioned in the video, and there's um, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition. It's a little bit hard to see, but you know what I'm talking about. And there's also a couple um, there's also a couple like rare exclusives. Here's a version of Darius for the Genesis, as well as a version of Tetris. Um, so yeah, there's Road Ra uh, there's Road Rash 2, and um, really I think like one of the sore spots on here is that like there not there aren't too many sports games. Um, also, I'm kind of disappointed, like, there's not more stuff from, um, Electronic Arts back in the days, because, like, back in the day, let me explain, like, Electronic Arts, like, they were one of the few third-party publishers that took a chance on the Genesis, and, um, some of their, and, um, and, like, they were making Madden, NBA Live, they had games like B.O.B., Road Rash, um, Desert Strike, like, all those, like, um, um, they had a lot of franchises that got its start on the Genesis, and, like, during the 16-bit era, we associate Madden with the Sega Genesis. So, um, it's disappointing that, like, there's not a lot of EA stuff on here. And also, there's, no, um, beside that game, there's nothing really in the way of sports. So, that's even more disappointing. Um, but again, like, when you're dealing with these kinds of things, like, there's, everybody's got their own ideas as to, like, what should be added and what shouldn't be added. So, I'm going to stop to, um... I ain't been waiting long enough, so let's open it up. All right, now let's get this thing open. Oh yeah, one thing, one other thing that I didn't mention is that like there are two fighting games, well three if you count Virtual Fighter, but um, two games, Eternal Champions and Super Street Fighter 2, which um, you can still use the three buttons, but um, there are special six button controls, controls that you can buy from Retrobit, and I'll post a link to those in the um, channel description. Right now, you still got the three button. You still got the old classic three button, but that's the one everybody recognizes. So, let's open this thing. Of course, right here, you got the AC adapter. And you've got two USB control pads. And here's the controller. A, B, C, start button. <laughs> It's like 1991 all over again. Got yeah, like this packaging. Here is another one. See, yeah, there's a lot of two-player co-op games on here. So, and here is the. Here's obviously the adapter um, cable. There's a lot of two-player co-op games, so everything you pretty much need is out the box. Here's the HD. Here's the HD cord, and of course, here's the instruction manual. And last but not least, Sorry about that. Forgot our winger wasn't off. And last but not least, we have the Sega Genesis Mini Console. High definition graphics. It says 1991 all over again, except it's smaller. <laughs> so here's where you plug your controllers in. And here's all the connections. So unlike the last several um, ones, is like HDMI only. There might be an HDMI to RBG converter if you if you're like a really old school purist. So there's a reset button, and here's the on and off switch, and here's a flap, and here's the uh, cartridge flap. Obviously, you can't play cartridges on it, but it's it's, not, it's a nice thing to have. I mean, um, if you like, um, if you if you got any of the at game, I don't have any of the at games ones. I might. I might check the most recent one out, like sometime in the near future or whatever. But um, 
I think even just as a collector's item, I think this alone makes it worth it. Because it's like just the amount of detail that went into it, the amount of love that went into the system. And I, and I know like I know that last one has like similar. I know that At Games one, the the one that looks like a full size Genesis kind of has similar features like the non functioning volume switch and the and um, keys. But yeah, you can't do this on Nintendo. All right, so here is the unit. So uh, um. Nothing left to do, but let's get some footage from it and see how, and see how it plays. On the main screen, I've just started up the Sega Genesis Classic, and as you can see, this is the first screen where you choose the language. So we're going to start up the system. And here's the menu. Looks like you can sort by release date. Um, Alphabetical, genre, number of players. And here's a setting. Ah. Okay, the usual health warning for seizures and a manual you can read. Ooh, staff credit. Let's get and check out some of these games. Here's the Genesis Tetris. Let's see how this compares to the other versions of the game. Oh no, Frills, it's Tetris. At least when I hold down this time, um, it doesn't instantly head down, but. It speeds down a little. I like that, um, I like the, uh, Legends Flashback version. But otherwise, it's Tetris. I mean, there's nothing else to say to it, I mean, but I guess it is a rare Sega Genesis game. Let's try something else. So you gotta hold down the start button to uh, bring it up the menu. Let me change that background because it kind of looks distracting. Let's check out Mega Man The Wily Wars. Now, like I said earlier, like um, this was a game that's ex that was exclusive to the uh, Sega Channel, and what this is is actually a remake of the well, the first three games remade on the Genesis hardware. Yeah, I like that old Capcom startup sequence. Like every time you played a sixteen a game during a sixteen bit era, you saw that little jingle that lets you know you were playing a Capcom game. Wily's robots. Okay, so I guess this shows you like which robots you delete it. I think Mega Man 2. Of 
course, I played this game like a hundred times when it was on Nintendo. Or even with the Windows gaming compilation they came out with. Like, it just seems so weird seeing it run on Genesis hardware for the first time. That's the one I usually pick first when I play Mega Man 2, and his background music is like one of the best in um, in the series, so I want to see how it sounds in the Genesis hardware. That's right. It's Mega Man 2, so I can't slide or charge my weapon yet. You can't slide till 3, you can't charge your weapon till 4, which ain't on here. It kind of feels like what they did with Super Mario All-Stars on the uh, Nintendo where, they, where it's the same gameplay, but they enhance the soundtrack and the, mo and the music. I mean the music and the uh, graphics. Yeah, it's finally good to have this on here. <coughs> of course, if you were one of those people who got on the who download ROMs on Raspberry Pi, you've probably seen already. But still, this is a nice little extra to have. Those snorkel looking guys. Remember the snorks? That old TV show from back in the day? I'm gonna try another game. What happens if I press this, if I press this reset button on the console? Okay, that just brings up the uh, screen. Okay. Let's try something else. Ah, uh, Thunder Force 3. Sega Genesis had a lot of these games back in the day. This and the Turbo Graphics 16 had a huge amount of these types of games. These aren't quite bullet hell games, but um, you actually like the precursor to them because you're still shooting them up. It's like with an actual bullet hell game, like there's like a whole bunch of bullets around you. You gotta do whatever you can to dodge them. I know the bullet hell style, you know, got like real popular 
during the early 2000s. With games like the Eco Tours or whatever. I'm saying I can get my ass kicked. This actually used to be a pretty popular genre back in the day, and if you go on Steam, then they still make plenty of games in this style. I might even have um, some in my re in my um, replay box, in my um, replay, in my um, Twitch replay list. So check it out. Check out something else. All right, let's see. Ooh, Streets of Rage, too. That's a good one. Yeah, I like this first stage music. It's the blood pumping. I got my Genesis, like there was a bundle with both Sonic 2 and one with this. I wanted the one with uh, Streets of Rage 2, but, I couldn't, but my parents couldn't find it. I think the sound composer's name is uh, Yuzo Koshiro. I forget how you pronounce his name, but um, I think he also did the uh, mini music. He's got a lot of soundtrack that he put in this game. Nineties trip hop is best. Yeah, the beat em up was another genre that was actually pretty popular back in the day. You got the Double Dragon, River City Ransom, Final Fight, of course, and of course, Streets of Rage. 
that's another one. This this is another one that's coming back in this style. Um, you go on Steam or the Nintendo eShop and check out games like, uh, I think, Raging Justice. So I think so, this must be like the uh, fourth or fifth copy of this game I own. I the Sega Smashback version for Dreamcast. Um, I got it on Xbox Live when they were giving it away for free. I got it as part of the uh, Steam Genesis compilation. And I got the Sega one on Switch so I can play it on the go. Yeah, I'm playing this with the control pad. It's starting to feel like the old Genesis again. Like I said earlier, I was, I was more of a Super Nintendo guy. Like, I ended up getting like the uh, Genesis like later on. Like I said, like both systems had like some really awesome games. And like in the later, in, like um, in the later years of the Genesis, you had like games like Vector Man that, and Batman and Robin, which really stretched the. Uh, systems capabilities like graphically of course the main difference is like um, during the end like during the 1996 era I think Nintendo was doing everything it could to um, keep the SNES alive because then you had like Super Mario RPG Kirby Superstar even a version of Street Fighter Alpha 2 but like um, the Genesis they kind of like ended the U they kind of um put a curve on the U.S. support in favor of the Saturn. So they had crap like Sonic 3D Blast and Virtual Fighter 2, which for some reason they put on here. Another thing you gotta know about this game was like it was like one of the first beat 'em ups where you actually had like special moves. Like it wasn't like in Street Fighter, but like it was mo well. Also, Double Dragon had a same had a similar feature, but only because it was with less buttons. Like you can do stuff like that uppercut that I showed you. I want to play through here because like this boss was just so awesome. Of course, Streets of Rage 3 isn't bad either. Of course, in th it's I don't think it's on here, but um, any compilation which with Sega games on it will have both this, that, and the original. I wasn't really all that impressed with the first Streets of Rage, um, but it did have that sound soundtrack. And of course they are coming out with Streets of Rage 4 any day now. I'll go ahead and save. We'll do one more game. Let's do... Oh, 
Let's do Beyond Oasis. I think it's like a R an action RPG kind of like Zelda. which has possessed the soul of another, he will lead Oasis to ruin if you do not stop him. Of course, now they come with the backstory behind Oasis. If I remember, there weren't too many RPGs on the second Genesis. Um, you had Fantasy Star and you had Shining Force, but not a whole lot else. Super Nintendo was definitely the place to be if you wanted like RPGs. Again, mud again, Ali. Excavation, you say? What's the difference? Hey, take me up to the ruins next time, please. Oh, I'll be nice armor. Where'd you find it? I was just like, thought I was going to be running around figuring where I was supposed to go. So if I hold down on I can do a boss on that I can heal. Or I can shop or whatever. Yikes. defeated a hostile group which attacked him and hurried to see his teacher.
Yeah, I think this is like the closest thing that the Sega has to like the legend to like a Legend of Mana or a um. A, pff, did I say Legend of Mana? Uh, Secret of Mana. Yeah, it's several different moves I can use. Take him off pretty quickly. So, I think this is it. I think this will be it. I mean, let me save so I can come back to it. And this was the Sega Genesis Mini. So, that was the Sega Genesis Mini. It's starting to get dark outside, so I'm going to wrap this up. Um... One thing I didn't notice earlier that I didn't point out is that there's this flap thing, and I don't know how well you can see it now, it's pretty dark, but you can actually remove it, and you can avail that little mystery port, like, um, like, uh, this, like on the old Genesis, like this is where you would take the thing off and attach the, um, C, the, uh, Sega CD, uh, the Sega CD attachment to it. So, obviously, there's no, you can't hook up a Sega CD to this one, but... Still, it's a nice little thing, and it, sh and it really shows the dedication, the detail that Sega put into this device. Now, speaking of this, so, um, the bottom line of this device, um, what kind of audience is this? It, uh, would this be for? Um, if you're a hardcore retro uh, collector, then I prob that um, I probably that um, then I really don't see you stumbling over here. One of these. Um, you probably already got most of the original cartridges and some form of the original hardware. And like, um, I think the only thing that will make it worth it to a collector is the um, Darius game, the exclusive games, the uh, the Darius, Tetris, and um, Mega Man, because those are pretty rare games. And if you got one of the also, um, if you got one of the compilation that came out over the years, um, most recently there's the Sega Genesis collection that's on Switch, Steam, and um, Xbox One and PS4. Um, usually the compilation that they release usually have just Sega first party titles on it, but, um, this has a mixture of both first and third party ones. So, like, if you're, if, um, if you want more Sega action, then you can definitely do worse than this. Um, again, um, again, it's real, like, um, it's really difficult, like, just to scurry, like, what kind of audience, like, this will be meant at. If you're, if you're, if you're, if, you're, if um... You were a fan of Sega back in the days, then um, definitely the nostalgia factor is definitely a key attraction for this device. Like the games are on it, the em as you can as you saw from the video, the emulation is perfect. There's a lot of good games on here, and just like the char like just these little design um, patterns, like d just these little design things, like the um, volume key, the cartridge flap, the removable Sega CD thing. Um, 
So is it worth the eighty dollars? Um, I don't. Well, that depends on like how you view the games. Like at forty-two, that's like two bucks a game. So um, that's a little less than two bucks a game actually. But um, there's a pretty good. Um, again, there's a pretty good selection. Like it's gonna, it's it's ultimately gonna be up to you. Like if you're on the fence, wait till there's a little price drop. But um, if you um, maybe you maybe you want to buy it for the kids. Like show them what real games are like. Um, the only bad, the only really bad thing is that like um, there are some games on here that should have been that um, there are some games that are not on here that probably should have been like maybe Sonic Three and Knuckles or maybe some more sports titles or maybe some more EA stuff. But like I said earlier, like when you're going through these things, like you're always gonna have um, opinions on like what game should be on here and what game shouldn't. And there's and just like that, there's stuff on here that definitely shouldn't be. Virtual Fighter 2 immediately comes to mind. Why did we need that? Why did Sega release that damn thing? Why does it insist on sticking it on there when it could have put something like, I don't know, um, um, I don't know, Desert Strike. And again, um, my only ever beef is that they give you three button pads when there are two games on here that play easier, that were, um, made for a six button pad. But then again, but um, then again, even with that, um, most of the games on here play with the three button pad anyway, so you're not really missing a whole lot. It's not like those two, the um, the uh, two fighting games, Eternal Champions and Street Fighter, they aren't unplayable with it. They're just hard to play with a three button. But still, they could have packed in a three six button off um, from the start. So again, this is the Sega Genesis. This is the Sega Genesis Mini. It's an excellent. It's an excellent throwback to the 16-bit days. Um, like I said, like the nostalgia value is going to be the biggest factor um, in whether or not you're going to buy one. But um, if you're if you're a collector, if you're into these sorts of things, then I would definitely recommend it. Now, how does it stack up to the other uh, plug-and-play consoles that I that um I showed off the At Games, the um the Legends Flashback, and the Super Retro Gate? Um, um, I would say um, I would say it's around, um, I would say it's probably around the same. Well, I take it back because well, no, 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 it probably is the same because um, they all got a good variety of games. Um, some of them do have some puzzling inclusions, but um, I think out of all three of them, the Genesis is the be is the most well made, just as all this attention to detail. And with these controllers, you know, um, I know you can't see it with the lighting and whatnot. It's like um, it's almost like you're playing the real thing all over again. I mean, the closest thing, I mean, the, I mean, the only way it can be the actual real Genesis experience is if you're actually playing the Sega Genesis. So, yeah, that's the Sega Genesis Mini. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Make sure you follow me on Twitter. If you like what you just saw, click like and click subscribe. And let me know how you feel about it in the comments. And hopefully I will be back with some more unboxing videos.